So lead paint, the overall point of the whole lead paint program is to worry and make sure that children six and under are protected from paint that may contain lead in it. So the first and most important thing you want to be, just as an overall framework, be thinking about is the fact that we're focusing on children, focusing on children six and under. We're focusing on places where there may be lead paint in those locations where children can be found. So the two typical types of places are houses, housing, and child facilities. So that's what we're going to zero in on and talk about. Quick overview of what the background is in terms of the structure of the program itself. This just gives you some information about where the regulations are found, where they come from, and what they're overall meant to zero in on, which is just to protect against the dangers in lead paint and dust and soil in housing and in child-occupied facilities. And this just gives you some more information, background information about the different parts of the statute, the regulations, where things are found, if you need to go back and take a look at them. What we try to do in all the materials is give you a lot of information. We're going to pick and choose as to which parts of it we're going to delve into more deeply, the areas that we think are going to be most relevant as you go out and want to learn more about the program. But in case you need to delve more deeply into any parts of it, we try everywhere we can to give you information references to both the regulations and any policies that are relevant so that if you need to go back at another point and look at things, you know where to go to take a look at them. For those of you who are not aware, and I think you probably all are aware, almost every program is duly regulated, meaning the EPA, the federal government, has a program. And in most instances, the states also have a corresponding state program as well. And that's true in Georgia for the lead paint regulations. So in addition to the federal regulations that were just up on the screen, you've also got Georgia regulations. And as a general rule, the state and the federal regulations overlap to a very considerable degree. In a couple of instances, the state goes beyond the EPA, but in most instances, they overlap fairly carefully. So there also are state regulations to be looking at and thinking about. And again, the whole point of these regulations, we're going to zero in on two key areas, what's called target housing, where people live, and child-occupied facilities, where children spend a considerable amount of time. Those are the two key areas on any campus and in any other area. That Great question, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. If you hold with me for one minute, that is a great question. The question is, what's the age of the children that we're talking about? And we're talking about child-occupied facilities. In everything, we're talking about children that are six and under. And we're going to get into that in more detail, but that's a very good question. Thank you. So I'm going to focus first on housing for a minute, and then I'm going to get to the child-occupied facilities. So I'll walk you through first what we're talking about in terms of housing, and then afterwards what we're talking about in terms of child-occupied facilities. So, again, this is the specific legal definition, what it means to have target housing. And the key thing first is that it's housing that was constructed prior to 1978. Who knows why we're focusing on housing constructed prior to 1978? After 1978, there was no lead-based paint. Starting in 1978, it was illegal to use lead-based paint anymore in the United States. So to the extent you've got housing or any other buildings that were built after 1978, they are presumed to be clean. They're clear. We're only focusing on older buildings, buildings from before 1978. If I had a cookie, I'd throw it to you. So um, we're also going to, I'm going to go into this a little more detail. We're also going to focus in on particularly what it means to be within that housing that's from 1978 and earlier, pre-1978, and what it means to have a zero bedroom dwelling. It's an odd concept. But particularly for a college campus, we are talking about something that the living area is not separated from the sleeping area. Can anybody think of an example of where you've got a living area and a sleeping area that are the same on a college campus? Traditional dorm. A traditional dorm room, absolutely. So the good news is for any college campus, whether it was built before 1978 or not, if it is a traditional dorm room, your standard student-issued dorm room, we're not worried about that because the assumption is children will not be living in that location. This is a quick flow chart that I'm going to walk through with you that talks about and sort of takes the definition, tries to parse it down a little bit in a way that's a little more friendly and easy to read. 
but the assumption is we're always looking to try to figure out where children may be living, where they could be exposed to lead paint. So we start up at the top with all housing. And you separate it into two categories. Anything that was in 1970, built in 78 or later, the regulations no longer apply. That's clean, that's green, don't worry about it. We're only going to focus in on things that are from earlier than 1978. So focusing just on the housing that is built before 1978, again, there are two categories that the regulations break it down into. You've got housing that was built for the elderly or the disabled, and no children are expected to live there. If it's a senior housing center, if it's a facility that was built for people who have disabilities where, again, there are no children expected to be there, don't worry about it. Unlikely to come up on a college campus anyway, but this is just to walk you through the definition. We're going to focus in on general housing, other housing that is not included in this category. So within that general housing category, what are we talking about? Well, we're going to focus in on housing that has at least one bedroom in it. And again, those typical dormitory rooms on a college campus, set those aside. So if we're going to set the dormitory rooms aside, what could we be thinking about for a typical college campus? What other kinds of housing might be at a college campus? We're looking for the um, residence director's apartments. Absolutely. Residence directors, RDs, RAs. Apartments where, in fact, somebody could have a child living with them. The rule is not, does the child actually live there? The rule is, could a child live there? So you can have an RD who is single, who has no children. But if they're living in an apartment where there is enough room and space that it, they could be married, they could have a child living with them, then that is considered to be covered. Any other kind of housing that might come up on a campus besides RDs and RAs? Student apartment style housing. Off campus housing that is owned by the school or on campus housing that is more of a traditional conventional apartment building. Graduate student housing is often more conventional apartment style <coughs> housing. Absolutely. Any other kind of housing? President's house. President's house. Absolutely right. Unfortunately, good news and bad news is president, the provost, the chancellor, anybody who lives in campus housing, it may be a very nice house. If it is from before 1978, then that is considered to be covered housing. Well, it's no longer used as a house, but it's office space. If it is office space, then it is no longer a house. It has to be used as a facility where a child could be living there. Again, the president may be well past the point where he or she has children under the age of six. That doesn't matter. If they are living in the house as a house, then that is considered to be housing that you need to look into. If it is a house that is now only used for functions, for receptions, for office space. It's no longer a house, so then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? So that's the general rule. There's one more category that we want to sort through, which is even if you have general housing, even if it has at least one bedroom, if it has been certified as deleted, then again, you're in the clear. Something was built before 1978 with bedrooms. If it has been certified as deleted, that's great. Take it off the table and don't worry about it. It's those locations where it has not been certified yet that you still have to worry about it. Well, what you need, we're going to walk through what you have to do. But yes, as the school being in, trying to come into compliance, what you have to do, if you have a housing, any housing, that is not in the green category, it's still in the red category, then you have to make sure that everybody who's living there is on notice and they have signed the appropriate forms. Absolutely. Yes. And you raise a very good question, which I didn't mention, which is, it is not enough to just paint over the lead paint. Even if it's 10 or 40, or as you said, 5,000 times, that's not enough. You need, in order to make it fall out of the red category into the green category, you have to formally make sure that it has been appropriately decertified, delighted. The answer is yes. You are looking individual room or living unit by living unit. So within a given building, if you've got two RD units on a floor, mixed in with 20 student dormitories on that floor. The 20 student dormitory rooms fall off the table, but the individual RD units within the building, you need to make sure that you are 
getting the appropriate paperwork sign off from each person living in that room. The best practice would be look at the old dorm. I mean, they were all painted. You, you don't have to focus in on the dorm rooms, the individual dorm rooms at all. Don't worry about those. But you must make sure that anyone who's living in the RD units is signing off and making sure you are making them aware that there could be lead paint in those units. That's what the law requires. That's a, it's another very good question. What if the unit itself maybe is decertified, is lead, is lead decertified, but the hallways still contain lead paint in them? If the child is living there and they have a reasonable likelihood of coming into contact with the lead paint, then you have to put the adults on notice, yes. So this is just a quick review of child occupied facilities, and I want to get to the sale, the sale question in just a minute, later on in the materials. We talked about housing for a few minutes. In terms of child occupied facilities, the question came up earlier, how old is the child and what do they need to, what issues do we need to be thinking about? They have to be six or under, and to constitute a child occupied facility, they have to be visiting there at least two days a week. Each visit has to be at least three hours. Combined, altogether, they have to spend at least six hours a week there and at least 60 hours a year. So your odd visit by your neighbor's friend's son doesn't count. But a daycare facility, a child care facility, a summer camp program where the kids are spending at least that amount of time there, those are the kinds of issues and programs that we're talking about. Yeah, and again, it's six and under. So anything that is over six, you do not have to worry about. So we've covered this. You all did a great job. You passed the quiz. The different kinds of places and programs that you want to be thinking about across the campus. And again, this is the exception. If you get it decertified, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. In terms of the disclosure regulations, and this is getting to the question about sale, there are three types of disclosure requirements. If you're renting, and rent is a very general term, doesn't mean money changing hands. It can be as part of a contract or in a work agreement. Somebody gets the benefit of living in college housing. Then you must issue the disclosure and have them sign it. If the campus is selling a building, a, hou a housing unit, then you need to make sure that the disclosure has occurred. How far back do you have to go? The quick short answer is, I don't know. Obviously, at some point, if it fades into the distant past, it's going to be irrelevant. But Legally, you were supposed to have started doing this quite a while ago. The quick rule of thumb is we generally try to go back about three years, which is all you're required to keep records under most programs, including the lead paint program. So at most, we're going to look back and we're going to ask for three years' worth of records. Uh, any regulator is mostly likely going to only look back about three years at most. So. Beyond that, I would not worry about it. And then the last one, which we'll talk about very quickly, is if you have the housing or the child care facilities being renovated, what should you be thinking about? So quickly, if you're going to be renting out housing, then you want to make sure you make these disclosures. And you don't <coughs> need to necessarily be paying rent. All right? And again, there's one small exception. If it's less than 100 days, and a one-time rental for the summer, then that's exempted out of the regulations. You have to make sure that the school conducts the appropriate disclosures. And there's an example of the disclosure pamphlet that needs to be handed out in the materials. And for every single lease, you want to make sure that the tenants, all the tenants, sign the release. Then they acknowledge that they received the pamphlets. Okay, so you want to make sure that they get the acknowledgement and they sign it. And you have to keep a copy for at least three years. Okay. Target sale housing, again, same requirement. If you're renovating a building that is either a child care facility or housing that could contain children under six, then you need to make sure that the occupants are provided with notice if the college employees are conducting the renovations, then the college has to make sure that the notice goes out. If a contractor is conducting the renovations, then it is the co contractor's responsibility. 
Typically, I expect that most of the times the contractor is doing the work. But if for some reason the school employees are doing the renovations, then the school must send out the appropriate notice. Okay? And similarly, even if you're not doing work in the actual living unit, if you're just doing work in the common areas, you have to still make sure that you're notifying them and giving them an opportunity to receive the pamphlet. It's a slightly lower burden on the school, but it's still there and you make sure that you want to meet that. Even though the contractor has that responsibility as a good practice, obviously you'd want the school to make sure that the school is putting that clearly in the contract with the contractor. So there is no dispute as to what should have been done because unfortunately the school is typically the much bigger target. If there's something that goes wrong someday, the school is going to be the obvious target. So even if you don't actually have that responsibility, you want to make sure that you're covered. And this just spells out some requirements for what the renovations are. And again, you want to make sure that you keep those records for three years. This provides you with a link to where you can get the EPA pamphlet. It's on the EPA website. There's also a copy of it in the materials. We talked a little bit before about certifications for abatement. This is what you'd want to be thinking about in the event that a school chose to conduct abatements, what you'd want to be thinking about, making sure that the people who are conducting the abatement are properly certified and are properly trained to be conducting the kind of work that they're doing. And you want to make sure that you provide appropriate notification to EPD if that abatement is going to be occurring. I'm going through this more quickly because this is less likely to occur. The more typical situation comes up with the rentals, with the housing units, but I just want people to be aware of this. In terms of some quick audit tips, things to be looking at and thinking about as you are part of the audit team, you want to look at all the target housing records going back a couple of years, and you want to make sure that all of the lessees, all of the tenants sign the acknowledgement. The reason we keep focusing on all is because most likely if you have an off-campus apartment with five students in there, it's not enough to have one student sign on behalf of all of them. You want to have every person who's living in that unit sign that lease. Also, if it's a lease that gets renewed from year to year, many times in many college campuses, five of us get together. The second year, one moves on and lives somewhere else and we get a new roommate in. Well, if the four of us sign the lease again, and the fifth one doesn't sign the acknowledgement, he or she is living in that unit and they have not signed the agreement, the acknowledgement, the release. So you want to make sure that every person who is living in that unit each year signs off. Okay? And then we talked about the president and upper administration making sure that they too sign it. Even though you wouldn't expect that you have to involve them in this instance, you absolutely want to make sure that they've complied with it just like everybody else. And then finally, you want to make sure that if somebody from the system is performing the lead work, that they have the appropriate documentation, that EPD has been given the appropriate notice, and that appropriate disposal records are being kept for all lead activity in the event that it occurs. Now, if, uh, I went through it fairly quickly, but if you look back in the materials a bit, there is an exemption. If you are renting it for less than 100 days, and it's a one-time rental, then you are not covered. You, that's exempted out. You just want to make sure that it is less than 100 days, and that it's a one-time rental. If it's typically for three months over the summer, that's 90 days roughly, don't worry about it. It's certainly for one night. But what they don't want is an end run where you rent something for three months, and then another three months, and therefore you cover the entire year that way. So that's why it's got to be a one-time rental for less than 100 days. Does that exempt the summer camp or not? It's not. The rules for the housing and the rules for the child care facilities are different. The child care facilities, you have to look at those time measurements that were in the materials. Three hours at a time, at least two days a week, more than 60 hours a year. Then you would fall under the category where you've got to worry about it. If you're less than those trigger time frames, then you're safe. Yeah, he was talking about housing campers. Oh, housing campers? Did I misunderstand? Summer camps are, are yeah, if, we, if, we had a, if we had a camp that was a week long. Oh, if you had a camp, at, if the children were six and under, they have to be six and under to even worry about this at all. If you have children six and under who are living in this, but if it's less than 100 days, 
if it's less than 100 days, then you... Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. I don't know. Let me try to find that out. My initial assumption is if it's less than 100 days, you probably don't have to worry about it, but let me check. <laughs> 